Hello everyone and welcome to How Green Marketing Works and this is our Inspiring Entrepreneurs series and it's a little bit different today because I also think it's kind of the Inspiring Expert series or Inspiring Legend series because I have the wonderful Marty Newmeyer here with me today and uh, to share a little bit of time with each with you and also to share some of his story, his where he's come from because one of the things that I love about uh, his own profile is that he said he knew he wanted to be a graphic designer when he was seven and that whole journey to where he is now working with CEOs having written so many wonderful books and changing the lives of so many professionals and companies around the world so welcome Marty delighted to have you here well thank you Fanula happy <laughs> very well so let's start really and hello everyone I'm delighted you're here with us too so um what I'd like to start with is, and hello, Clara, I see that you're already in with us now. So what I'd like to do with is um, share with us, you knew from age seven what you wanted to be when you grew up. <laughs> so I'll let you take it away. That's pretty crazy, but true. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. uh, in second grade, I think it was, they asked everybody, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And uh you know, I want to be a nurse or a little boy would say, I want to be a fire truck. And I mean, they didn't even know anything. They just knew that, you know, um, cowboy, whatever. Uh, and I said, uh, commercial artists. Wow. <laughs> Everyone, what, what is that? Uh, and I said, you know, drawing things and, you know, you get money for it. <laughs> How did you know at seven what that was? Because my mother went to design school. She went to art school to be a, a fashion illustrator. Wonderful. And, um, you know, I used to watch her um, draw, just like she would just doodle, you know, how most people doodle and they would little squares and squiggles and lines. She would be, when she was on the telephone, talking with someone about something completely different, she would be drawing these like beautiful faces, you know, all oh, so real realistic, beautifully proportioned faces and they'd be all over the page by the time she, was finished and I'd say, how did you do that? She says, oh, you know, you can learn now. It's just something you, you learn. I went, you're kidding me, can you show me that? She goes, oh yeah, she says, let's draw a face into a circle and the eyes go here and, you know, and then if you want to make it like in perspective, you change it and, and it was way over my head, but um, she told me I could do it. So uh, I started drawing things and um, when you do that at a young age and you have someone to teach you, you get pretty good at it pretty fast. And uh, when you show your work to other kids, like at school in seventh grade or eighth grade, they can't believe it. They're just like, that's magic. That's totally magic. Oh. Um, and so I bring to school pictures of like um, clipper ships with all the sails and perspective and all the little lines drawn, really complicated, you know, waves parting and <laughs> seagulls. <laughs> and uh, or, or uh, I got a bird book from my mother and I was copying all the birds you know in color and what I took from that is well that's what I am you know I'm just a kid I don't know what the options are in life <laughs> I just thought obviously I am the school artist there's nobody else in my class and that's what I'm going to be and so I just set my mind to that and uh, it's, it's certainly simplified uh, all my choices in life because I knew that's what I was going to do. And, and uh, it was only later that I realized life was bigger than that first thing you choose in, in seventh grade, uh, se seven years old, rather. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. But then you yeah. moved from that. So, and, and I'm sure that has influenced how you think because you're drawing as you think, I'm sure. I think so, yeah. I mean, I was interested in a lot more things too. I just yeah. focused on that as a career, but yeah. uh, I was pretty good at uh, an English class, went to Catholic school, so there was a big emphasis on that, and there wasn't an emphasis on anything else creative, so that, that was the thing you could do. Um, you know, and I could spell and diagram a sentence and all that, so I, I was picking that up, and um, I think that influenced me quite a bit. Yeah. And it was only when I was, oh, I would say early 20s when I started realizing if I want to be a graphic designer, um, that's really taking control over a, a, a piece of communication. And the communication isn't complete if it's just graphics. There has to be a verbal component. There almost always is, right? Yeah. Unless it's a 
some a visual, like a trademark or illustration or something. So um, I wanted to control that too. And I, I, ha I worked with copywriters in the beginning and I just thought, you know, I, th I could just do this myself. I can have much more control over it and um, get a result that doesn't look like words stuck onto pictures or pictures stuck onto words. It looks like they were born together. Right? You probably like, were. Yeah, yeah, they were, they, it was stripped down to, it was just like you, you couldn't take one piece away and have it work. So um, I think that was the beginning of being a writer and also um, realizing that strategy is really important, that, that you can do great graphic design, um, or, or design a great product, but if you if you don't connect that with a business outcome, like some expected outcome, um, you're just never going to get very far, and you're not going to be able to explain your work to someone who would pay you a lot to do it <laughs> to, to work on at, it. At what point did you realize that in your career? At what point did you? Because it's uh, interesting, you a lot of graphic designers won't have. The, the verbiage, they will be pure designers yeah. and will bring, yeah. so you're unusual. And right, they'll go into a meeting and say, so what I was thinking, mm -hmm. or, you know, and then they'll show you a bunch of things, and it's like, if I were a business person, I'd say, well, who cares what you're thinking? <laughs> it's like, what's, <laughs> all, with all due respect, what are we, what's this gonna lead to? What are we getting out of this? How is this gonna work? And if you can't explain that, if you can't connect the dots for them, like I'm doing it like this, so we can create this, which will change this, which will create profits. Then, then you're going to be sort of pushed down in the in the food chain, right? They'll stick yeah. you in a, a little room with no windows, basically, and a yeah. computer, and, and they'll tell you what to do. So, if you want to have control over your work and do work that you're proud of and that has an effect in the world, you need to kind of move up the food chain and start learning about. A little bit about how business works, uh, how marketing works, where you fit in the in the uh, uh, the brand community, how you're going to add value. You need to prove it. You need maybe to get cozy with uh, research and testing of your own uh, own ideas, so that it's not just about your opinion. Um, I, and I know from being a designer, you can have a very strong opinion about your work. Uh, you can believe in it like crazy, and it can still be wrong. And I only found that out when I was oh, probably 40 years old before I actually tested that, like tested my work to see how good it was and tested ideas against each other. And then what I found is, well, you know, sometimes I'm right, and sometimes I'm, I'm just fantastically wrong. So, um, and I certainly think my clients, because I was a, running a design firm, my clients were also wrong quite a bit. So when were they wrong? Neither, when were well, they wrong? What the, the reason clients go wrong is because they understand their position in this process to be a decision maker. Like you show me some ideas and I pick one. Or I take two and I tell you to mix those two together. <laughs> this is the worst possible thing. Um, so uh, um, so what I started to do is I say, look, n none of us are experts. We're all trying here. We all bring uh, some expertise to it. But uh, who is this really for? Is it for us in this room or is it for customers? And the client would always say, well, it's for customers, obviously. Right. So why don't we get some customers in the process just to, to make sure that we're not missing a point of view that we should be thinking about. And so um, I started bringing clients to um, real world, world situations, like into a store where we were designing a package for uh, to go on a shelf next to, next to some competitors, and we'd uh, talk to customers, and I would take notes, and and uh, the client would be on the other side of the aisle listening, you know, pretending to be a shopper, and I'd get all these um, very cogent points from customers on what they were understanding from the work because. Um, you know, when you, you, you get close to something, you kind of, whether it's the actual work or whether it's your career, if you get too close to something, you can lose perspective. And so it's just great to, to get a preview of how that package or whatever it is you're designing, logo or whatever, is going to play out in the real world before you commit to it. 
before you commit to it. You have a chance to improve it. You have a chance to learn from it. So um, building those steps in was just a huge thing for me. And um, uh, it, it changed how I think, how I work. It made me more strategic because I was working with the client in real time, talking about like, what are we trying to achieve? Because they didn't often know. They would say, um, here's our product. Can you put, you know, Make sell it? For us? Yeah. I say, well, what are you, what is the competition doing? What, what, are, what are the choices that customers have when they go to the store? Who else are they thinking about? Oh, well, okay, well, and they, they had all that information, but they weren't sharing it. Uh, I said, okay, so who's number one in this, in this list of people for your customer, who's number one, who's number two, who's number three? Because number one is gonna win almost every time unless number one is so expensive they can't afford it. And then number two is gonna win. <laughs> if you're number five, what are you doing? <laughs> How are you going to compete? So um, all those kinds of questions really made clients think, they made me think, um, and I realized that I had to be strategic with my work because if I didn't do it, the client was certainly not going to even think of it. They're just trusting that it's all going to work out. But, you know, I wanted my packages to succeed in the market because it feels good to do that. But also you can point to it for your next client and say, you know what? I went to Apple Computer. Uh, I did all their software packaging and sales went up 40% in six months without changing the products. They'd, they'd go, how many products is that? It was 15 products. They all... Average 40%, average 40%. President said it, here it is. <laughs> and they'd go, okay, then how much is it gonna cost? I would say, well, it's gonna cost more than those other guys that are competing with me. But if you want that kind of result, you pay that kind of price. They always, you benchmark. Always. You benchmark when you walk in the door. Yeah, right. Well, you, you, you talk about actual results and, and you talk about how you got them. And if it all hangs together as a story, they're going to trust you more than someone else, even when they pay more for it. So that was like a light bulb going off. And I said, well, that's, that's remarkable. That, so th this, is, this is what strategy is about. So I was using strategy in my own business to separate myself from the competition. And then I realized my clients need strategy too, because mm. they're not that way they're they're just concerned with day-to-day -day stuff you know s selling stuff every day dealing with shareholders or whatever they have to do it's not long-term thinking or and it's certainly not how to make uh design work in the marketplace that they're trusting you on that so um that was that was the start of all these books i started reading about this and um realizing that no one was really paying much attention to it Good to Great, you mentioned that earlier before we uh, went live. Uh, that's a good book. Um, people should read that. It's a little bit old now, but had some brown, uh, groundbreaking ideas in it. I picked up on those. I picked up on uh, all the books of um, Trout and Reese uh, on positioning. Mm. Uh, that's how I got into this whole thing. Their thinking to me was so obvious and so clear that it just had to be right, uh, and it was. And then, you, you know, if you're a designer, because I think there's a lot of designers here today, yeah. Yeah. Um, you need to, to attach your work to that sort of strategic thinking. And then it becomes very powerful. And you can talk about it in ways that will get you listened to. You know, people will trust you more. But I think the main thing is to say that and then say, and guess what? Um, we're going to test some of these ideas, the important ones, um, with actual customers because we want to know before we you know, green light something. We want to know if it's going to work. Are you okay with that? They'll say, how much does it cost? You'll say, well, it's only five or 10% of the whole thing. They'll go, good investment. And then, and then you start to really learn about your craft, whatever it is you're doing, you start to learn what works and doesn't work. So I, I really recommend that. We talk, and I think we, we talk I covered that pretty well. The, first two books, the, brand, the brand gap and zag yeah. uh, both about that I, I love both so um what i wanted to to ask you to talk a little bit about was we talked before we became live and we talked about all of these different roles and one of the things that liquid agency which is your agency um now do what they call a scramble so that i, I shared with you my own process of working with clients and how 
I work with the graphic designer because I'm a strategist. I work with the graphic designer. I work with the client. It's very collaborative. And over the last few years, I've noticed that more and more we're working with, I'm working with a HR person in the organization to actually make sure what's on the outside is on the inside. And one of the things that you mentioned uh, was that you don't like to think of the employees as a customer. Whereas it's in, a mar in marketing speak, we talk about the internal customer. And I'd love you to talk about why, and I liked you, you mentioned this idea of porous walls, not to be so rigid on what we think of as those, the naming of things, I suppose. Mm, the naming of things is important. Mm. Uh, by the way, I have a dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that works across all my books, all eight books, I think, um, called Brand A to Z, and it's free. Yes. Uh, if you go to my website, martynewmeyer.com, you can download it for free. Um, it's fun. It's fun to look through. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, um, yes, naming things is important. And, and I think you're right that it's good to think about um, employees as customers in a way. But I think if you go too far with that, you lose the fact that they're employees. Yeah. You know, they have their own set of concerns. They're getting paid. They have to do what you say or at least pretend to. Uh, customers do not. Customers are true volunteers. They only hang with you when uh, when they want to. Uh, and it's different with, with employees. They stick around longer and they know they have a duty to the company. So, I like that, that idea of customer as volunteer. That's, uh, uh, because yeah, I like that idea. Scripts. They're, they're not, you know, in the old days, you know, branding was about um, you create a product, you decide what it's going to be, you decide what to name it, uh, you create some messaging, and you blast it out there on TV with, with millions of dollars. And often there's no choice for people because they only know about your brand because you're the one talking all the time. <laughs> they hate it. They hate that you're doing that, but that's the choice they have. So they only can say yes or no to your product. Mm. Um, now, customers have a lot of choices. And they can talk. They can. They can get. Um, they 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 get a view into what you're doing online, and they also talk to each other. So um, it's no longer this one-way conversation. It doesn't work like that anymore. You really have to um, seduce people to join your tribe, which is what I call it now. Mm -hmm. um, your tribe, your 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 customer tribe, your your brand tribe is people that support you and probably will support you even when, when you're not doing things very well. Even when things aren't going well, they'll still support you. They're loyal to you and they're loyal to each other within the tribe. That's how tribes work. Um, so that's really what you're creating as a tribe. If you're building a brand, you're creating not only individual uh, customers, but tribe members who will reinforce what's good about your brand with each other. Um, so that, that's, um, a great thing to be able to talk about and to offer to clients because, you know, leaders of companies intuitively understand I'm building a, they think of it as maybe a family or something, but a family of customers or a family of employees, but they realize it's a community and someone has to take charge of that community. And I think that person should be the title for that person in a medium or large size company should be chief brand officer. Chief brand officer should be, at the top or near the top of the company, not somebody that works for a marketing director. So it's, if anything, it's the other way around. Marketing directors need to work for whoever's in charge of the brand. So, so my example, my poster boy for that is Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs was CEO of Apple, but he was really the CBO of Apple. He was the chief brand officer. He managed the products, the communications, the customers, the developers. He did not manage shareholders. He did not manage uh, finance. So he was uh, something different. And actually, he didn't manage the company. There was some probably Tim Cook at, at finally in the end was the real CEO. So he took over for Steve Jobs, but now there's no Steve Jobs. There's nobody running the brand at Apple. And that's why you're seeing uh, less... Um, Innovation. Yeah. Uh, it's exciting now. It's more status quo, keeping keeping things moving. You know, that's that's the typical work of a operate chief operating officer or a CEO. But what you need is a CBO if you want to uh, keep innovating, which is what Steve Jobs promised everybody. And delivered. Shall yeah. I? We've had some questions. 
Oh, good. I so love I questions. It would be really good, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to throw a couple of questions at you at this. So we have a question from Greg, who has a design agency in Nebraska. And he says, what That's is Greg the key? Doc. Doc? Greg, is that you? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. He says, I what's think. the future of branding? Is there a new word, a new approach, and a new method? And I went back to him and I said, I asked him to clarify a little because I wanted more. And he said, yes, I'm feeling there is a need for a rebirth or revolution of this thing called branding. It's largely misunderstood. And since Par Marty's is such a pioneering mind, I am curious as to what he sees as the next horizon for the work we all do. And is there a new label to attach to it? In right. other words, what problems are we all serving, solving in 40 years? The same, different, slightly different, vastly different. Okay, Who so first, the revolution? I, I understand that it's difficult to use the word brand because it has baggage. Yeah. Uh, in the last, um, you know, 100 years, uh, and probably before that, branding was identifying products and companies. You know, it was logos and messaging and that sort of thing. Um, and it's become much more than that. It's, it's more, much more inclusive. So that's hard to get across. If you've got in your mind a brand as a logo, you know, if you're the CEO and you think that's what branding is, it's all the corporate identity stuff. Yeah, it's gonna be difficult for you to understand that it's more than that. So should we create another word for that? And I think, no, I just think it's just gonna be this painful transition until people realize that the word they know is bigger. That's, I, I struggled with this for a long time, but I think coming up with a new word for it, new words can't just be minted like that. They have to be organic and we already have it. So it's easier to expand the word we already have. So that's that. Uh, the other thing I see happening in, in branding, uh, happening right now, is that companies understand that to do this work properly, they need to engage the whole company in this process. Mm. Right? So it's a cultural thing too. So. Um, it's, it's about designing a culture and CEOs really are interested in this. How do I design a culture? You would think that a CEO could get people to do whatever he or she wanted. They're the boss, right? But that's the thing they worry about all the time. It's like, I keep telling them what I want from them and they don't follow me. Okay. So, um, it's a continuing frustration. So that's the culture is broken in that case. They're, um, he's unable to get people to follow. So what you need to do is, is work on that culture, redesign the culture, uh, create new processes, create new understandings of what we are all doing together. I mean, branding is just um, um, solving this problem. How do you get a, uh, a complex organization to execute a simple idea? Mm. Because good brands are always very simple and easy to understand, you know. Nike, for example. Oh, it's about finding your inner athlete. Okay, I get that. That's what I thought. You know, everything else just ladders up to that, right? Mm. Apple is about using technology um, to create more, um, you know, to make you smarter, right? To make you smarter and uh, more design focused, let's say, in their case. Uh, every good brand has a very simple proposition. Um, but how do you get the whole company on that wavelength, right? And, and so that's where the CEOs are at a loss because they've never been trained to do that. They've been trained to think of brand as logos and it's something the marketing manager handles. And it's really more like the marketing manager should report to the, the chief brand officer because brand is every bit as big as the company itself. You think about a company that's got an inside and it's an outside. The inside is all the usual CEO stuff. The outside is the brand. It's the way the important people think of you and the, the important people are customers. So um, this is something companies are realizing that they need someone to manage customers, the whole customer community, because that's how they're going to succeed. Customers have a voice. They're volunteers. They're not conscripts. You can't make them do anything. You need them. And they, and in a sense, they run the company. If you're doing it right, your customers are running the company and you're serving them serving customers so, so you're, teaching, you're teaching your employees to serve customers always then and not uh, just serve process 
That's right. So if you look at it like um, the whole sort of link linkage, mm -hmm. uh, the management supports uh, employees. Employees serve customers. Uh, customers uh, create profits and serving shareholders, and shareholders need to support management, the leaders. And what's happening is shareholders are saying, "No, give me money now. I want my money off the top." Uh, that's when companies go go wrong, you know. So a good a good CEO is one that can hold off the shareholders and say, "No, you're last in line. You get money because all this other stuff is working first because we're managing our." employees well they're serving the customers well customers are making money for you you get it last <laughs> right that's just the way it has to work so um that's the reverse of what it has been and that's why business has been just so horrible in the last 50 years it's like terrible to work for some of these big businesses uh shareholders come first um you know customers hate these companies and, and there's still a lot of them around there but we're in the middle of a kind of business revolution where everything's getting flipped upside down. So that, that, that's the sub subject of my second to the last book, The Brand Flip. It describes how branding has flipped everything and uh, for, for good. I mean, it's a, it's, a good, it's a good trend. I want to ask you a question. Or rather, mm -hmm. someone here wants to ask you a question. She says, okay. Rachel, who's a designer, what if you don't, and she's a designer of homewares, what if you don't have a whole company or team to help or work with you? You work for yourself, but need to clarify your brand for your customer. Yeah, so um, I think you need to figure out how to work, be part of various teams. So if you're a solo uh, person, maybe you start networking with people either by just because you're already working with them on different projects, but volunteer to go, go to meetings where the other players are instead of just being sort of divided and conquered, you know? So um, you say to your, whoever hired you, well, um, you know, my, whatever I'm designing needs to fit with the strategy. So can I be in the meeting with the strategist where that happens? You know, just ask and just keep insinuating yourself into groups of people where you can uh, have your voice heard, learn something from them, make sure that your work dovetails with, with theirs. Um, and then if you ever, anyone asks your opinion, you tell them, look, I think teams, are, teams work great, but you have to have people working simultaneously. You can't separate them if you really want coordination between the various players. But if, if and I, because I know Rachel, if that part, this is a small business and that's so she, it is her business. So yeah. it's that working on your own question. Right, well, you don't have a lot of say, do you? So, um, <laughs> yeah. but you can ask and you can, and you can keep asking and you can politely say, well, who else is working on various parts of this? What is this? What do I have? To, what, what does my work, how does my work connect with other people's work? And then you say, okay, can I be in that meeting? Um, and maybe you don't get paid a lot for that to go to those meetings, but I think it's a start and you'll be taken more seriously when you start asking questions that are above your pay grade. Like, that's what I always did. It's like, I was really nervous the first time I said, what's the strategy for this product? Not knowing very much about strategy at all. And they would go, uh, uh, um, I don't know, we don't have a strategy. Ah, okay, well maybe I can help you with that. <laughs> because you need a strategy. We need a strategy together. Um, so, you know, read, read more about branding, read about, uh, well, I think The Brand Gap is a good place to start my first book because it talks about collaboration. Yeah. And it, and it poses um, a framework where a company can hire a lot of individual people and get them to work as a virtual team. It's a good way to do it if you have someone very strong within the company that can make all those people play together nicely. Um, you can get great, great work. And so wouldn't you want to be on that team that's doing great, great work? Cool. Another question for you. Does the customer client experience have a knock on effect on building brand? And if so, how can you manage this? Okay, uh, you cut out there for a minute. Can you repeat it? Does customer, this is from Kate, does customer or client experience have a knock-on effect on building a brand? And if so, how can you manage this? I don't know what client experience means in this case. Do um, you think you have a, can explain that a different way? Or customer yeah, experience? Last case. Experience, I mean, customer experience is really important to building a brand because that's how they form an opinion 
that's one way to form an opinion is actual use of a brand, right? Or a product or a service. When you actually experience it, you say, oh, okay, I think I get what it is. And you make it, you form an op opinion about it. It's, you know, you, you're giving it a reputation. It's, 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 it has a rep reputation with you. So that's what branding is. It's a commercial reputation. Uh, lots of ways to, those are all touch points, by the way. So touch points are places where the product or the service touches customers, where they come in contact with it. So it could be seeing the name, it could be hearing the name, it could be seeing a television commercial, it could be seeing product on a shelf, it could be using the product, it could be reading about the company in a, in a magazine, it could be any of these things, or hearing somebody in, these days, hearing someone talking, talking about it or seeing it on Twitter. Uh, those are all touch points that as, as a brand builder, you need to try to control as much as possible. You can't control them, but you can try to influence them in a way that gives you the outcome that, that you want. You need to be aware of them. Um, so I can probably say that, you know, my definition of, of a brand is uh, a person's um, gut feeling about a product, service, or organization. It's, it's not a product. Brand is not a product. Brand is not a logo. A brand is not the sum of all experiences. What it is, is a person's understanding about a product, service, or company. And so it's in their heads. It's in their heads. And that's where the battle is fought. You have to understand what's in there. Who's competing for their attention in their heads? Who are the competitors? What are they saying? What advantages do they have over you? Um, how can you give them something that would uh, meet their expectations better than what the competition can? Is it price? We hope not. Is it, it could be anything. Uh, it could be that your brand is, uh, seems more like you than the other brands. Yeah. And, and you can identify with other people using that brand. So you join that tribe, not even knowing why. You just know that my friends are doing it. I'm going to do it. I trust my friends. You know? So um, this these, are all, these are all touch points. Um, let me ask you another question. Yeah. Um, this is from Matt, who's a branding consultant in Nottingham, and I know he did your, um, your new masterclass. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> um, what do you think brands should focus on in order to prepare for an uncertain future, and what practical things might they need to put in place to ensure they are set up for success? Yeah. Um, well, as far as... Uh, you know, predicting the future, of course, that can't be done, but the best way to understand where your brand should go is to pay attention to customers and see what they're saying. And uh, social media is just beautiful for that. I mean, it's the, the most important thing it does for companies is let you get some insight into what customers are thinking. So if you're involved in social media about your brand and you are watching it, You'll find people that are maybe unhappy with parts of what you're doing and they are uh, saying, well, what's wrong with this stupid company? Why don't they do X? And you're going, why don't we do X? And if you start hearing those kinds of people saying that a lot, they're, they're giving you a glimpse of what's sort of missing in your company that you could fill in. And, and uh, they're not saying, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to a different company because I know they have X. They're gonna say, uh, it's just not there, and I wish that it would do that. So, and, and after a while, if you're really good at this, if you have a, a firm or a department that's really good at this, they'll find those people that are always coming up with future ideas for you, and they'll target those, and they'll pay attention to those people because they're really good at it. There's just some people that are ahead of everybody else, right? They're always thinking ahead. Well, that's free. That's free ideas right there. And um, so uh, that's one way to stay ahead. The other way is just do what Steve Jobs is, you, you, you know, did, is he empathized so much with customers, his view of customers, his sort of advanced customers, that he knew what they wanted. He didn't have to do research, he knew it. He was just in that, that, in that headspace. Um, some people are good at that, some people aren't. So and that's you another way. You don't, um, you don't stop the research. Well, he, you know, he famously said he doesn't believe in research, but they did tons of research. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was there. Um, and so, uh, but the research was typically not in deciding to do something, but in making sure that it was working the way that they imagined it was, and it was creating the, uh, 
the bond with customers that they hoped it was. And so they would sort of be testing iterations of things quietly, privately, uh, in, internally, and then with certain people on the outside very carefully, not to, you know, to alert the media uh, and and uh, let the cat, cat out of the bag. They wanted to fail off Broadway, not on Broadway, right? So they wanted to test it out quietly. And then when they knew it worked, like when Steve Jobs showed the iPhone for the first time, he said, it just works. Well, that was a, took a lot of effort to get to that stage where it just works, right? Yeah. But that's, you know, he was into perfecting something before he announced it. So um, that's one way to do it. It's, it's a fine way to do it if you can. Um, and you need designers to perfect things. So uh, another reason I think products shouldn't be created like uh, in an evolutionary way. I think they should be designed. I don't think they should be trial and error uh, on on the stage where everybody can see it until it's right. I mean, that's kind of what Microsoft did. And you can see what happened to them after a while. They got a really good early start and then nobody wanted their products because they weren't designed. Yeah, great. I have another question for you. Um, a design agency in Dublin, Barbara, she says, it's, she said, Marty, it was you who changed my business for the better after I first read the brand gap and I have since been selling the idea of putting brand strategy first before any deliverables. Thank you for that. She said, I want to talk about the reluctance to spend money on brand. I see so many small businesses relying solely on referrals and projecting, and this is a real Irish phrase, a dog's dinner of an image to the world. So my question is, what do you say to this sector to educate them on the value of building a strong brand by starting with strategy and let them know how it can change their business for the better? Well, I just give them a free copy of the brand gap. Great. <laughs> it works. I love it. I don't know how many people are, are doing that. Uh, lots of designers, they just frustrate. They say, just read this, okay? We'll, then we'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me what you think of this before we talk. Cool. Uh, and, or any of my books, which are all slightly different topics, but um, if it's about strategy, Zag is good. If it's about building a culture, then the design for the company is good. If it's about um, social media and branding, then the brand flip and, and so forth. Um, so that's what, how people are using the books. They're giving them away as just like stand, like, you know, this is part of the package. If you want to work together, read this because we're pretty much in line with this and it'll be a way it'll be a little our little book club we'll talk about this and see how this could apply to your company um and so that's and that's even probably um put stickies on key passages or something that you want them to read in case they don't say they don't yeah. have time Just read this page you know or two pages yeah there's exactly. 50 words on one of my page in one of my books but uh yeah do, re read this chapter and and let's talk um, you'll find out if they're anywhere near your wavelength, um, it may open their minds. You still have quite a bit of opportunity to, um, to build on whatever it is that they're reading without, you know, it's, it's you know, reading a book. Isn't the same as like following a formula. At least my books aren't, there's no formulas. They're just principles. Uh, what you do with them is up to you, how you personalize those and professionalize those is up to you. But there's I would certain... also make a suggestion, which is your book Scramble, because that is really, I loved reading it. I loved reading it because it was storytelling and it took all of these ideas from the brand gap and zag and all of that and brought them to life in, in that scenario. So it wasn't that idea of theory. It was, this is how we did it. Yes. So for, for, uh, participants here who don't know that book it's um it's it's written as a, a business thriller so it's a thriller about a business that's um suddenly is struggling and has to do something differently to survive and uh, there are the usual villains and heroes and so forth in, in there but the idea is to um explore how using these principles would actually feel in real in the real world like you know if you read something in a book it sounds great you know, then you go to try it in practice and you go, well, people aren't letting me do it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's them. And, and that's what happens. It's like, you know, unless everybody's on the same wavelength, it's going to be difficult to get any new ideas through. So, you, you know, so this book explores how to get through that, how to get everyone on the same page, that whole process of uh, you hinted at it. Uh, it's called swarming. Um, the book is called Scramble. And that's part of that's one way of swarming. Swarming is when you have everybody working on the, 
problem at the same time. The designers, the clients, the writers, the strategists, the researchers are all working in the same room, um, sharing ideas in real time instead of doing it you know, step by step. Because the problem with doing things step by step is that usually the so-called important decisions are made first, then the less, less, lesser ones and lesser ones and lesser ones to you just down to the details. But what happens is every time you make a decision up here, it's cut off for the people down there. They can't influence that decision. And I know from experience, and maybe some of you designers know, uh, after this, um, you know, the strategy has been set, you can come up with an amazing idea that is just not part of that strategy, but this, it should have been. <laughs> you know, they just hadn't thought of it because no, you thought of it. Nobody had thought of it before you, like, uh, alighted on it um, just do, in the process of your work and you brought it to them and then you said look I got this better idea no 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 that's not part of the strategy it's cut off that door is closed that chapter is closed so to avoid that you have the book open the whole time everybody's working and bouncing ideas off each other until you come to some uh, mutual decision about it and and in doing that uh, the work is usually better and the client uh, is willing to to, to defend that idea to the death after that. They will go with that no matter what until they need to change it. They, will, they won't say later, oh, that, that seemed good at the time, but we're not, gonna, we're not doing that anymore. We've hired a different company mm. in, in a different way. So, um, because it was theirs. They were part yeah. of its inception. Yeah, well, they're, they're just bought into it at that stage. So I love that idea. And it's, it, it works great. You need to be um, comfortable working uh, live in front of people, right? Yeah. You have to be skilled enough. So it's a it's pretty advanced branding, but for people that are um, fearless and um, uh, and also humble enough to to uh, understand that they're not always right, they thrive in this kind of thing. And and um, it's just a really quick way to get some great results. In one week, you can prototype a whole brand, like you know, with all the key components: the logo, maybe a name, a website, product package. Uh, if you get enough people in the room working fast and furious, uh, at the end of a week, you can say, wow, this is what the brand could be. And then the, the leaders can say, do we want to do that or not? Or how much do we want to do this? Do we want to go another round and try something else? But almost inevitably, they're going to go mostly with what they've got because it's there and it's gorgeous and they helped. I love, there's a quote by David Packard of Hewlett Packard, which is, Marketing is too important to be left to the marketing department. And that's it. That is, yeah. are you brave enough to have us all there and you get end to end? Great. Well, business is too important to be, to be owned by business leaders too. I mean, you know, other people need to be involved. Uh, it's, it's, it's totally true. Um, we, all, we need more collaboration. We need more respect for each other's contributions, which can be very different. Designers think completely differently. They think with their hands often, um, and but they come up with uh, ideas you'd never ever think about. You know, if you were being logical. At the same time, logical people have a way of holding you, holding your nose to the grindstone, saying, "No, that's great, but that's not going to work for us." Because here's what we're trying to do. Did you forget? <laughs> I mean, these two two ways of thinking are really great together, um, and it's just easier to understand each other when you're in the room together. And, um, so that's how we arrange it these days. Uh, we call it swarming. Uh, if you read Scramble, you'll see a beautiful um, illustration of how that works out um, and, and the difficulty of it too. It's not easy. It's, as I say, it's advanced. Yeah. Another question for you. And this is from Katya, who's a design agency in Slovenia. So we've got them all over the place. Um, she designs brand identities, visual assets. And, she, and show companies how they incorporate that into their promotional material for better brand recognition. She wants to know what the value, future of the value of these brand assets, like a visual brand identity, like logos, color schemes, and things that are representing the visual, brand visually and consistently. Well, you know, you can measure this. What was interesting, she feels that the value of visual assets is decreasing because we have so many possibilities to market our services and products that consistency and recognizability in that sense isn't that important to companies anymore. Well observed, that's true. A friend of mine was, um, in, in his, the peak of his career, he was a great logo designer, trademark designer. 
working on his own out of his garage studio and, and working with some of the best Silicon Valley companies, you know, and, and being paid quite a bit of money for these things. You know, thirty to a hundred thousand dollars for a logo and the stationery that went with it and the colors and all that kind of stuff. And then one day it stopped just like that and never came back. It was just like someone flipped a switch. And I think it was a, a bunch of things. It, you know, up to a certain point, the only thing you, the only way designer could, a graphic designer could influence a, a brand was trademarks and colors and typefaces and uh, type, you know, page design systems, templates, and things like that. Um, and so that that business grew into something very important because it it could have an effect. But what happened is people realized there are many more objects and you know, um, you know touch points uh, that that could influence customers. It just including websites. I think websites probably did it. I think they just saw well, I can spend thirty thousand dollars on a new trademark and it'll be gorgeous, or I can spend it on my website and I'll get customers from it. <laughs> right. So I think we'll just let the web design company do the logo <laughs> for five hundred dollars or whatever, just as part of their work. So it, it went from being the focus of attention to being uh, kind of just not that important. But it still is important. It's super important. Um, uh, it's just that there are other things that are important, too. And so you, you, as a brand designer, you need to be open to all these things that can be designed and, and not focus on one. Um, you know, I mean, I still think a, a logo is worth spending $10,000 on if the company is any, any kind of size at all. And it may be worth spending a million on for some companies. So it's still worth something. And to think that you can just take a logo, you know, off somebody's website or out of a book or something, and it's going to be important and valuable and long lasting, that's just insanity. Um, so that's why we need uh, chief brand officers to, to make those determinations and to make sure that everyone understands the relative value of all the pieces that go to build a brand. Cool. I'm just going to see if we have any last questions. And then you might tell us. Um, yes, someone was saying the book you mentioned earlier, uh, besides the brand gap, we have several. Um, we have the brand flip which I can show you the brand flip we have scramble and we have meta skills and we have the innovation toolkit so lots from Marty but just google Marty and we'll find it Marty is is there can I ask you one other question which is is there a project that you're involved with with liquid agency or recently that you loved most or that has always stuck with you or the story always stuck with you? Um, with Li Liquid Agency. Or I any agency, it doesn't matter who, just the one I that- I go back to when I was um, designing software packages, that was when I learned quite a bit uh, of the material that I'm talking about now. I did have a favorite client and it was, um, it was Apple, it was their, their um, their software division, which they call Claris, C-L-A-R-I-S. So that was the part, the division, it had, it had its own president and so forth. They spun it off, but it was really uh, owned by Apple. And those people were just great to work with, open-minded, educated, um, bright, um, curious, creative people. And um, they were involved in a very big project, which was to change all the packaging, all the way they, the whole way they communicated about software at Apple, um, because the problem that they were facing was uh, Microsoft was beating the pants off of them um, uh, and because it was open to all kinds of software. There's just so many more choices. So Apple had to create their own software for the Macintosh, mainly, um, so that people would buy the Macintosh. It was the, you know, without software, who's going to buy it? And so they really needed to succeed. It was super important to them. And um, they went out there into the marketplace with software, uh, software packaging that was designed internally by Apple. Uh, and it was just completely wrongheaded. It was, um, it looked like the most boring corporation in the world, more boring than IBM, who was the stated enemy of the personal computer yeah. industry. More boring than that, it was just like 
gray and blue uh, stripes and panels with people working in offices and then screenshots on the front next to the name. And I just said, this does not look like it came from Apple. This is not the Apple that I know, you know, all the beautiful ads and everything, beautiful logos and stuff. So um, they gave us the job, this is a big deal for us, they gave us the job of designing all 15 at once uh, with almost an unlimited budget. Um, had to work all around the world in every language and every um, culture. Okay. And so we, we did well with it. We, we really put a lot of effort into it and, and we created, I don't know, 70 or 80 ideas, narrowed them down finally to, I believe, 18 that we presented. And up to that point, we we're having a blast, you know, it's going great. <laughs> and we present 18 of our best ideas in little mock-ups about, you know, two inches high. We did everything miniature uh, so people could like analyze them too much. Um, and I took them to Apple uh, and they set it up so that everyone in the company, and I think there's probably 800 people could vote <laughs> on which packets they wanted. That was pretty scary. And then the CEO would come in at the end of the day, he'd look at the votes, he'd look at the, uh, uh, all the ideas, and he would say, okay, let's focus on these, the, this, these three or something. And so um, the voting went well, people were pretty excited, had all the little mock-ups, the little packages on a shelf, uh, along a, on a window, a shelf, sort of like the middle part of a window. Uh, CEO comes in, I'd never met him before. He's a really nice guy, but I didn't know. You know, he, he was very stern when he came in. And he said, okay, what do you got? I got? I only have half hour, so let's make this quick. It's like, we've been working on this for three months. You know, He's got a half hour. <laughs> and so he, um, he looks at all these packages and uh, looks at everyone, goes down the line. And then he goes and looks at them again and he starts knocking them off the shelf with his finger. There's just these little paper packages onto the floor, everyone, because they're all on the floor, and he says, that's it. I don't like any of them. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, luckily, I didn't know what to say. So I just sat there for a while and waited. Everyone, no one said a word. And I said, all right, it's the first round, so that's, that's, uh, that's fair. Um, let's try something else. Let's put them all back up and go and knock them down again, but leave the ones that you just that you don't hate <laughs> oh the ones you hate take those out the ones you don't hate hate is the bar uh leave those in and he comes back and he says you know what there's three here that i don't hate <laughs> I said, great now we have something to work with and he started wow. liking them he started defending them and you know started things started to change and everybody started to talk again <laughs> and so it warmed up and then um and all the boxes are on the floor. And one of the marketing people said, you know, now that we've been making some progress, I'd like to re put, I'd like to talk about this one. And he pulls up this one that's almost all white and it's got this very loose drawing of a icon uh, on it, bold type and everything. He says, this is like, I've never seen anything like this in a software store. What about this? And the uh, president looks at it and goes, well, that's very different. He goes, yeah, but we want a big change, don't we? Shouldn't, isn't it going to be different, whatever we do? He goes, well, I just don't know. I mean, I just don't know if we have the courage to do something like that. Wow. And uh, then he turns to me and says, can we test these? Mm. And this is where testing, I learned about testing, because it was either we test these or uh, that one's gone. <laughs> so, uh, of course we can test these. Of course we can test these. We're going to test them in the store with real customers, and we're going to tell you what they say. And we're going to bring you to the store, too. Okay, great. We did it, and that one, that crazy one, was far and away the winner. You could see it from a mile away. Everyone in the store said they loved it. They said, this is much more than what Apple should be doing. Why didn't you do this before? Blah, blah, blah. We went forward with it, and sales went up 40% with no change to the product. And then he was a believer and the whole software industry became a believer when we told them that story because they noticed this, this, this gutsy, crazy solution to a software package and, uh, and everybody wanted our services. So that was my favorite experience. Fantastic. But you had to, it's so interesting, you had to hold your ego and hold your nerve 
to come back from them all being on the floor. <laughs> yeah, that was that was tough not to just just like argue, uh, like most designers would say. No, but my idea was, or you know, um, you know, just resist. Um, I couldn't resist. I just said, "Good point. Why don't we find out?" You know, you have, you know, let's test. And, um, and in that case, testing proved at least that we were right about that one design. Uh, and after that, I said, "I don't. I just, I was addicted to that, and I just thought I don't want to do anything that's not successful. And if I can find out before it's produced." I'm in. I don't care what it does to my thinking or my ego. It's like my ego will be fine after it succeeds. <laughs> and, yeah. I, and I just, I won't show anything bad. I'll just you know, always show work that I think is really good. Wonderful. That's a really good note to leave people on. I would like you to tell us, and thank you, I would like you to tell us um, where we can experience more of Martin Neumeyer live because I know you're coming to Dublin, but I also know that you have these are amazing brand workshops, um, which you must come to Dublin for. <laughs> but anyway, but so. We're planning to do one in Dublin next year or sometime. It's cool. just that we, we need help in putting these on. And, and the group that's putting on this conference can do it, but they need more lead time. So uh, this year at uh, Design Leaders Conference, mm -hmm. uh, November 6th, November 7th, I will be there. On no November 6th, I'm giving a talk. I'm going to give a talk on Scramble, the new book, the, yeah. the design, through the business thriller. And then on November 7th, I'm giving, I think it's a half-day workshop on the brand flip. So those two things. And then um, I'm also giving, uh, teaching my course, uh, Brand Masterclass. Um, it's a two-day course uh, that uh, where you, you, get a cert you get certified in branding at, at the, at the uh, starting level. Uh, you get a certificate and you can put it in your LinkedIn page and you'll be surprised what it can do for you. Uh, and that's not in Dublin because we're not ready. Dublin's not ready for us or we're not ready for Dublin. I'm not sure which, but we've got... We will come to Dublin next year or should we be traveling? Well, I think you... Why wait? You know, I mean, it's we're, we're going to be in Glasgow. Okay, yeah. That's very far. Uh, and in London. So uh, we're also in Lausanne, Switzerland. We're also in um, Hamburg. So... Okay. Uh, one of those would be good or wait till next year. But um, the, the, the whole, the way this is set up, it's the company is level C and it's set up with a five tier program. So this is the first tier. We're going to roll out one tier per year. Uh, you need to pass one course before you get to the next one. And by the time you get to the fifth one, you're going to be ready to be a CBO chief brand officer or a thought leader in your uh, subject area. Um, that's the goal for these. And we're not going to get a lot of those people finishing at the black belt level, but um, we're going to get a lot of people at the first and second level, I think. Because uh, just right there, you can really uh, change your fortune with that. We've got people that took the first course uh, that are already getting titles of chief brand officer. we got three already. Uh, chief brand after one course, not even after the fifth. So there's obviously a hunger out there for people that have actual brand knowledge, very specific brand knowledge and can explain it. And that's what you learn. You learn how to be part of a brand team and you learn how to explain it to uh, bosses and clients and each other. Um, so it's, it's even at that first class, we're already getting people doing what the fifth class is supposed to do. So I can only imagine what's going to happen when we get there, but please join us. Um, it's going to be a great time. Well, you know, you'll be, uh, it'll be a small enough group in any of these where you're, uh, you'll get attention and a chance to be heard and learn and uh, meet some other interesting people. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, Marty. Thank you, Fanula. Bye, everybody. Have a great day. You're unstoppable.